Um, so I'm excited to introduce Grace Lindsay, um, who is a computational neuroscientist. Um, and uh, she has had a very uh, rapid rise in, in her own field. I think she's already very well known uh, for her work there. She's currently a um, uh, Sainsbury Wellcome and Gatsby Fellow uh, based in the Computational Neuroscience Unit at, at UCL. Um, she's also uh, a uh, you know, very effective and impressive pop, um, science communicator. Um, and so I'm looking forward to that aspect of her talk as well. So I guess, uh, Grace, uh, if you're ready, um, we're ready for you. Okay, so um, coming from, you know, the, the side of being a computational neuroscientist and, and building models and all of that, I'm going to try to tackle um, the, the question of how connect, uh, the connectome data that that Moritz talked about collecting, how can that actually impact the development of AI? Because that is kind of the second part of the question that, um, that we're raising here today is how will this sustain the revolution in AI? Um, so that implies that we're at a current place in, in AI um, and we wanna know how connectomic data can, can help keep that going. Uh, so the way that I see uh, the way that neuroscience can influence AI uh, is there's kind of a, a spectrum of, um, you know, how, where, where the influence can take place. And most broadly, uh, we can aim to build AI that matches biological behaviors. Now, in some way, that's almost the definition of AI. It's artificial intelligence, and it's implied that, you know, the intelligence you're referring to is biological, and you're trying to form an artificial version. But beyond kind of the broad strokes, you know, we want computers that are smart, um, you can really dig deep into human or animal behavior and come up with very targeted goals of what kind of behavior you want your AI to have. And you can hope that by matching the details, including the errors of biological behavior, that you'll be able to design a system that, you know, is robust and, and, and acts like biological intelligence. So that's focusing just on kind of the outputs of the biology, the behavior that the organisms produce. Uh, and you don't really have to look at the brain at all to do that level of, of neuro to AI influence. Uh, if you go one step further, you can try to aim to replicate the algorithms that the brain implements. So kind of thinking of this as like the software level of the brain, what is it that we're actually doing that leads, you know, kind of under the hood that leads to these intelligent behaviors? Can we try to reverse engineer those algorithms and put that into an AI? And then in the most detailed level, you can actually try to just replicate uh, the architecture of the brain. So look at the, uh, the neurons and how they're connected and try to make artificial brains in that kind of direct mapping. Um, and these kind of relate also to Mars levels, which is talked about in computational neuroscience with uh, matching behavior being like, you know, getting the same computational level, getting the same goal for the system, then the algorithmic level uh, in Mars levels would obviously be matching the brain's algorithms, and then the implementation level is the actual, uh, you know, physical architecture that the brain uses to implement those algorithms. So we can try to, um, to kind of make AI match up with uh, the brain at any of these levels. I would say that there is a difference in uh, how hard it is to identify the goals when you're using these different uh, levels that you wanna match at. So as I said, for the behavior side, you don't have to look at a brain at all and that makes things a lot easier. <laughs> it's not that hard. I mean, it's not that easy, but it's not that hard to uh, observe the behavior of humans or animals in the lab or the real world and try to kind of distill that down into a goal for your AI to match. Uh, and sometimes that's as simple as having humans label images and then try to get an AI to, um, to produce the same labels for those images. Um, on the other far end is the, uh, the capturing the architecture, which means essentially getting the connectome uh, of the brain that you're interested in replicating. And I, I'm not saying that's easy at all. Um, and, you know, I have it here is definitely more difficult than, than matching the, the biological behavior and where it showed, you know, all the steps that go into actually getting that connectome data and it is difficult. But I would still say that that end of it is actually easier than identifying the algorithms that the brain uses because the, the algorithms that the brain uses can't be read out in an EM scan. They're kind of this more abstract uh, thing that we pull out of a combination of a lot of different data. And so in some ways that's the hardest level to try to replicate. Now I think connectomic data can have an influence for both of these two um, uh, uh, 
parts of the spectrum on the right here, the replicating brain algorithms and capturing architecture. So that's what I'm going to talk about is the influence that um, connectomic data can have in, uh, in those two ways of making neuroscience and, and AI uh, meet up. So I'm going to start with talking about how we can use connectomic data to um, replicate the architecture uh, of the brain. So to start talking about that, I kind of have to talk about where we are in the kind of AI revolution and what's used um, for AI these days. And that is primarily artificial neural networks. And uh, very simply, artificial neural networks just try to replicate the very basic uh, computations that neurons do. So you can see here, this is an example of an artificial neuron. It gets three inputs from other artificial neurons. Each of those artificial neurons has an activity value, which you could think of as a firing rate. Um, and the uh, activity of each of those input neurons gets multiplied by a weight, which is here in black. And then you sum all that up and that gives you input to this artificial neuron. Uh, that input goes through some sort of nonlinear activation function. Uh, and then that produces an output. And the most common one that people use today is just the rectified linear unit. So that means that any input that is uh, below uh, zero gets set to zero. So in this case, the, the input was negative four. So the output of this neuron is zero and anything above zero is just set to the value that it is. Uh, so that's the, the basic building block of artificial neural networks. They were inspired by real neurons in the forties. Um, and so, uh, then when we talk about deep neural networks, the idea is just that you take a bunch of these artificial neurons and you stack them really deep. Um, and from doing that and uh, setting the weights just right, you can have a situation where you put in an input, like an image, you put in the pixel values of an image, and uh, you propagate through that, that through all the layers of the artificial network. And the last layer could give you an output, like a label of what's in that image. That's the kind of um, transformation that these deep artificial neural networks can do. And the way that we set those weights, because those weights are really what define, you know, what the network does is through an algor algorithm called backpropagation, which just involves uh, having kind of a target for that last layer of what the activity should look like when it gets a certain input. Uh, you can find the difference between what it should look like and what it does look like when you first initialize the network randomly. And then you just kind of propagate that information back through the network and update all of the weights all of these connections between the neurons uh, to make the network better at producing the correct output. So that's the basic structure of artificial neural networks. You can obviously see that uh, there's a pretty decent place to input connectomic data here because, as I said, the whole function of the artificial neural network is defined by uh, the weights between the neurons and the connections between the neurons. So it seems like maybe we have some straightforward way to put in connectomic influence. And so that's what I want to talk about. Um, so I think you can kind of think of it as two different ways that you can take in uh, connectomic data and put it into an artificial neural network. You can try something like an exact replica if you have the full weights of a set of neurons and you just want to make that model just do the exact thing uh, with artificial neurons. You can do that. There's always going to be some caveats that make it not an exact replica. Uh, or you can just talk about general statistics, like on average, this cell type is connected to that cell type with some distribution, and I'm going to replicate that in my model. So an example um, of talking about kind of this exact replica type, this is from uh, a review article on this idea of, um, you know, building models based on connectomic data. And you can see here that there are, um, you know, the things that you extract from uh, the EM data to get to a point where uh, you, you are building a model, you can get things like, certainly you can get kind of the binary connectivity matrix that you could um, put into your model. So just what cells are connected to what. You can also potentially have synaptic weight data or cell type data, excitatory inhibitory uh, relationships. And so you can um, kind of pull that out. And as I showed with the artificial neural network, there is just really a direct way to, to put that in. You can put the weight values into an artificial neural network. Uh, an example of that being done is in uh, this uh, paper that uses the FLY uh, visual system, the connector from the FLY visual system to, uh, to build uh, basically a model that kind of is the full, is constrained by the fly visual connectum. And then there's a few layers of learning uh, to do um, emotional uh, emotion uh, detection task. Uh, and then they note that when they uh, initialize the connections with the true connectome, they can replicate some properties of the real neurons in doing that. Uh, and then, uh, so I, I'll note, you know, 
this and a lot of the papers that for now focus on using real connectome data are a bit more focused on using it to build a model and then compare it back to the brain. Uh, there are some people who try to use connectome data, obviously, to build better AI, um, but there are maybe reasons why that's not the most efficient route right now, and we can get into that. Um, but certainly, there, there, there is this you know, mechanism for putting connectomic data into artificial neural networks. On the general statistics side, we can look at kind of things that people naturally pull out of, when, of the connectome when they have it. Uh, so, for example, you can talk about motifs. So that's just kind of patterns of connectivity. If you look at three cells in your uh, network, how often are they connected in these different ways? And you can look at a distribution um, of those motifs, how frequently they show up in the data. And uh, basically, people have identified kind of these histograms that show that, you know, like the C. elegans is not a random network. Um, if you just pulled a random network, it would have a dis different distribution of motifs than we actually find in the biology. And so you could build an artificial neural network that is uh, at least initialized with the distribution of motifs that we see in the real data and maybe hope that that helps it accomplish some task more efficiently than if you actually started with a random network. Uh, another example of kind of general statistics is this um, paper that built something called MouseNet which uses Allen Institute data, um, a lot of different data, some about connection probabilities, but also a little bit about the properties of the cells and things um, to give kind of a broad overview of the mouse visual architecture and kind of how many cells from different areas should connect to other areas and that kind of what resolution and that kind of thing. Um, and so they're using not precise connectomic data, but broad statistics of the connectivity between different visual areas and different layers within visual areas to define an architecture um, and then train that architecture. So this is not uh, defining the weights based on the connectome, it's just defining which cells are allowed to connect to which other cells based on broad um, connectivity data. So some of the difficulties with this direct approach of transferring the details of the brain to artificial neural networks is that basically uh, to bring in uh, the connectivity detail, you already have to have other detail present, basically. So in the generic artificial neural networks that people use in machine learning, there isn't different cell types. All of the cells are just this like basic ReLU, at least for most of these networks. Um, and so the idea of saying, oh, this cell connects to that cell in the brain, well, now you need to define something as being those cells in the network, and you need to kind of give them special properties that make them identifiable as that cell, or at least it's smart to do that to actually have a kind of a meaningful relationship between the data and the model. Uh, and so that requires adding this, this other detail to um, the model. And then the second issue is, as I said, these networks are trained to do tasks. And if you're starting with a weight matrix, the question is kind of how do you best incorporate that with the idea of training? Should you just uh, let the network train un in an unconstrained way and just reset the weights as it needs to? Should you try to constrain it to stay near the connectome? Uh, these are questions people have to fiddle with. So the second level of um, looking at the algorithms that the brain uses by studying connectomes, this has been, uh, you know, debated amongst neuroscientists uh, for a while, this kind of idea of, oh, we've had the, the C. elegans connectome for so long, and has it actually taught us anything about their brain or how to predict their behavior or anything like that? There's this open question almost of like, what do we do with the connectome data that gives us an algorithmic level understanding of the brain? Uh, and so some modeling papers that have kind of weighed in on this, kind of what can you do with a connectome? What can you get out of it? Uh, there's this paper that uses graph theory uh, to say, based on the motifs and the connectivity of a network, they can predict the attractor states of the activity of that network. So really kind of going directly from structure to function of some kind, like saying, if neurons are connected this way, this is the activity they're going to produce. Now, of course, this can only be done in very simple model networks for now, but there is that kind of hope that you could look at a connectome and actually predict the activity um, that the network will produce. And in this case, attractors are computationally important for a lot of different things like memory or producing kind of central pattern generators and that kind of thing. So being able to look at structure and predict um, kind of the long-term behavior of the network is actually quite valuable as a way of understanding the algorithms that the network is implementing. Another paper looked at um, if you train these large artificial neural networks using a bunch of different um, uh, learning methods, uh, 
and then you want to say, oh, I don't know what I trained them on, kind of blind yourself to what you train the networks on and ask, can I look at the network and determine what it was trained uh, with, what learning algorithm it was trained with? Uh, this was asking if you look at the weights of the network and how they trained over time, can you determine which learning algorithm was used? If you look at the activity of the network and how it uh, changed over time, can you determine this? And then also if you look at kind of the uh, transformation that individual layers in the network do, uh, can, you, uh, can you determine which learning algorithm was used? And um, they find that uh, you can use the weights, so basically the connectome and how it changed over time. Uh, you can use that to get pretty good performance on determining which learning algorithm was used. This is just comparing two different learning algorithms. So chance performance here is uh, 50%. So you can get up to 89% if you um, have access to all of the weights and there's no noise in your data. But you can see here that uh, as you add noise to the data and as you are only able to sample a subset of the weights, that performance really falls off a lot to around chance levels. Uh, if you're just looking at the weights. Whereas if you look at the activity, it actually is more robust to um, noise and subsampling. So in this case, they're claiming that actually here the connectome isn't uh, as helpful in reverse engineering the learning algorithm that was used. Actually, activity is more helpful. And of course, activity is a lot easier to get, especially over time. So in this case, there's a kind of a conclusion that the weights aren't the best metric, especially if you can't get them perfect and you can't uh, get them get them at multiple time points, get the full distribution of the weights at multiple time points. So that's kind of, you know, modeling papers that have tried to um, to look at this kind of thing, you know, come up both ways in very simple settings, the connections can tell you something about what the network is doing, but in more complex settings, uh, the connectivity might be harder to analyze and actually pull out this kind of algorithmic level description from. Uh, so basically some of the, the difficulties in, in doing this identification, um, I didn't talk specifically about Eve Martyr's work, but her work is really relevant here because she's used um, the connectome of a part of the lobster gut and um, a lot of different modeling techniques to speak to this relationship between the connectivity structure and what the circuit is actually doing. And one of the relevant things she finds is that there is a many to one mapping between the connectome and the, um, at least the activity that the, the network produces. And so that means that you can have a lot of different connectivity structures that in the end are producing the same activity. And so that complicates, you know, this idea of finding this relationship. Also, what her work shows is actually there's a many, many to one mapping the other way as well, because you can have a single uh, connectomic structure, you know, a single uh, uh, circuit architecture, but based on the presence of neuromodulators, it could actually produce very different activity. And so that again, just really puts a complication in trying to look at the connectivity to get the algorithm. And really, ultimately, if you want to get um, a sense of what the brain is doing by looking at the connectome, you just have to combine it with a bunch of other data and context, and basically you're just doing neuroscience then. So there's just not a shortcut from the connectome to an algorithm to AI. You basically just have to do all of neuroscience and then pull, you know, insights from, from neuroscience to, to use an AI. Um, so yeah, so the connectome can speak to, to this end of the spectrum of relating uh, AI to neuroscience, but uh, getting those algorithms out is really difficult, and there are a lot of caveats in trying to just um, match the structure directly uh, without, you know, adding a bunch of other detail that we would need to have to really make that structure have meaning in the context of an artificial neural network. Okay, thanks. Um, so thank you very much indeed. Uh... Grace, for that really brilliant synthesis. Um, so uh, I'm looking forward to some of the uh, uh, discussion points uh, afterwards that I think come out of that.